now like our panel to introduce themselves. Hi, um, I'm Caitlin um, and I, my nine to five is the League of Extraordinary Women, which is a female empowerment company and we run events and conferences and meetups, so similar to kind of this style, but I'm always on the other end, not here. Um, and then my side hustle is Mud, which is a clay-based beauty and health products and brands. So we have um, a whole range of products, which is um, beauty baths and masks, and then moving into edible beauty with um, edible clays, and then into hair care with um, clay products for hair. Uh, hi, I'm Courtney. Um, my 9 to 5 is a company that I started a couple of years ago with a friend. Um, we do podcast production and a bit of advertising agency work. Um, and yeah, the side hustle that we started, or that I started with another friend, is Inflatable Regatta. Um, it puts people in hundreds and now thousands of inflatable boats on the Yarra River. And we work with, I think, about seven or eight different organisations to make that happen. And um, yeah, it's just sort of, it's, it's growing. It comes around in February, so keep your eyes out. <laughs> Hi, my name is Laura. Um, my sort of nine till five, um, though hours are a bit versatile, is uh, Ida Sports. So we're making a women's football boot um, and leading up to a crowdfunder for that. Um, what pays the bills is consulting occasionally. Um, my side hustle is I run a not-for-profit called Equal Playing Fields and we set world records and challenge a lot of the gender inequalities that exist in sport. So we just came back from Jordan where we set a world record for the lowest altitude soccer match ever played. And then my side side hustle is uh, Brunswick Aces and we make non-alcoholic gin. I love that you've got a side side hustle. Yeah, I love exactly. that. Like, you have to keep adding them on now. I'm just like, what yeah. Are you so, yeah, this one is like... And I love, Courtney, that your day job is something you've also, you're an entrepreneur, so your day job is something you create as well, right? Being podcasting, did you join a company with that yours as well? Um, no, that's that's mine. Um, I was at the ABC and was, my inflatable regatta had started while I was at the ABC working. And um, I would walk to work because we lived in South Yarra and ABC's in South Melbourne and do all my calls for inflatable regatta on the walk to work, get there, run out of the office to take the calls that I'd put in in the morning and then walk home and sort of return all the calls. Um, and then when inflatable regatta got big enough that it gave me a bit of runway to start my own business, then I took all the cash out of one, plonked it into another and then just watched it sort of fade away <laughs> slowly and then just get topped up every now and again. And then um, we, we run on sponsorship and ticket sales, so that sort of comes around each year and we renegotiate that contract with our sponsors for Inflatable Regatta. Wow, that's brilliant. I want you guys to sort of take a step back all the way to the beginning of when your first side hustle, the one you're, you're mainly doing now, because I know you've got, yeah, as you said, you've got a few of them, uh, that your main side hustle that you spent most of your time on at the very first day, where did that start? Take us back to the journey. Where did the idea come from and what was your very first iteration of that like? Um, so I went to RMIT and did a entrepreneurship degree um, and in that last kind of semester um, you can either create a company or um, work with, an, um, with a corporate partner and do like a commercial kind of innovation for them and at that time um, my um, partner was Kmart so out of that um, our team kind of ended up winning the program and I ended up getting a position um, at Kmart. And then, you know, the corporate daily grind set in. It was nine to five and I hated it. Um, and I actually um, met with a couple of girlfriends who I went to uni with. Um, and we said, we've got this degree, why aren't we using it? Um, let's do something together. So one night we kind of all sat down and said, um, all right, let's go back and come up with 10 business ideas. Um, and then next week we'll kind of decide on what we want to do. Um, and in the end, the next week came and there was two of us at that stage, one of my friends actually moved to Sydney for a job offer, um, but Rosie and I actually came back and we both had the same idea on our piece of paper. So we're like, all right, instant validation, um, done, we'll just do um, this, and it was detox baths, and they were pretty massive in America at the time, and we decided um, how can we kind of make it um, entry into the Australian market, and that was with the use of an Australian detox clay, which is bentonite clay. Um, so we kind of did that kind of, I think it was mid-2014 um, that we kind of started thinking about that. At the time it was one product, mask? Yeah, so it was just mask. one okay. detox bath that could be used as a beauty mask as well. Yeah. Um, 
And then we are like, yep, done, we'll just do this. And it kind of went really well for the beginning. And we are like, oh, okay, but now we have to kind of do more products. So we just kind of developed Muscle Mud and then Immunity Mud. Um, and I was still working at Kmart 9 to 5. And Rosie actually worked for like a very large corporation as well. So she was working, you know, 9 to 5 or that yeah. as well. And then probably it started to grow, um, probably the start of 2016, we decided to actually make a business out of it because it was just a hobby. And that's when we started developing um, the edible clay and then now the um, dry shampoo as well. So it's been a bit hectic. How many products in total now? So it's still only five, but three different markets, which I don't know if I'd do that again. But um, it's What do you mean three different markets? So we've kind of got the beauty and giftware with um, the masks and bars, and then we've got the edible clay, which is more health and um, kind of fitness as well. And then um, we have our dry shampoo, which is more the hair care market. So it's good because we've got a broad range of like um, people we can tap into for stockists and a broad range of kind of massive retailers too that are interested in all different things and then they can swap out which ones are kind of suited to their market as well. Okay, so, yeah. fantastic. And Courtney? Um, uh, I grew up sort of around the Yarra River and we noticed that nobody was on the Yarra River so thought how can I get on the Yarra River? Um, <laughs> didn't have any money because I was studying um, and not working a lot and found out, figured out the cheapest way was to get on an inflatable boat. Got some friends on, we tried it, found out it was legal because I did my homework on that. Um, everybody had a good time a couple of years later. Um, somebody suggested that we do it again. Um, and so firstly, it was just for fun? Just for fun. Just to commute or do you it just for fun? <laughs> no, 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 just, just, just for something to do. You know, okay, there, are, there okay. are plenty of things. And it's sort so it wasn't of... the cheapest way to cross the right Yarra? No, no, no. <laughs> Actually, oh no, you could walk across the bridge, but if you're building a bridge, it would be in one where it's easy. <laughs> just trying to do the, like, well, maybe we could build it in the next one. <laughs> um, but um, actually, no, we've got, the, um, if anybody's been to the Grand Prix, there are these cube dot things you can put together. So, yeah. Um, sorry, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, we did it again in 2014, and that had about 30 people. And I drove to Kmart because the first thing I learned from doing 2018, or oh, sorry, 2008, nobody would bother to go and buy their own boat. So I had to go and do that. And then thought, well, you know, just got to do everything um, to get everybody to come along on this and give it a shot and see if they enjoy it. I went to Kmart in Campbellfield. The boats were $15, and the kids said, What are you going to do with all these boats, man? I said, I'm going to sell them for 30 because we've got an event coming on. It was a good, good, $15, nice. <laughs> um, I didn't count the money, which is <laughs> a bit silly, but I think we, we were up. And so we had 30 people, took a photo, and then put it on Facebook, but left the um, Facebook event open, and then it kicked off. Um, it's sort of like proof of concept. Um, we got people down the river safely, but we had 15,000 people that wanted to come wow. um, within three months of putting that up. Uh, and then we just started talking to everybody. Um, the, one of the things was we were having these serious conversations about water safety and river safety and how we're going to do that and what are the laws around this. And we didn't know anything. Like, I studied history. And the guy <laughs> who did it all with me, he's the project manager for a sign business. And so one of the sort of key things that helped us early on was just being patient, being listen, uh, listening. Um, you know, going away, working on things that we'd be told to do to make the river safe because, God forbid, somebody should fall in and drown. Yeah. Um, and then it came around to um, 2016 and we managed to get 500 people on with the help of calling in a whole lot of favours. Um, people... Boats have special safety features from Kmart? Or? No. <laughs> um, we, we found the supplier for Kmart, um, I think through Alibaba, which is great if you ever need anything like that. And. Um, uh, bought our own. Um, we didn't buy enough oars because we bought 350 boats, but only 350 oars. We need two oars for a boat. <laughs> so, you know, thankfully we weren't very big, so we weren't, we weren't like mucking up completely. And people were just giving us a go at that time. There wasn't much of an expectation. Um, and we called in a lot of favours. People would sort of come up to me and say, Oh, Courtney, I'm on a loose end. Can I give you a hand? Because I've seen that this thing's happening. And we just willed it into existence, really. And now it's something that operates outside me, outside the other people that you know run it. There's 140 volunteers that come along. And um, now, last year, just sorry, a couple of months ago, we did 2,000 people down the river. Um, it's 
much lower margin than we expected. So we never expect to really take too much money out of it, but you know, something that's sort of, you know, a little bit at the end that's reasonable. But um, the costs for it sort of pile up. And that's something that we never anticipated. We did a lot of budgeting, a lot of planning, a lot of talking to people. But until you actually do something, you don't realise all the stuff that comes back. You know, our accountant was saying, um, and he's a friend as well that just does it because he likes <laughs> us. Um, oh, you know, I said, Lee's complaining about, you know, we've got this much profit, but there's only this much in the bank account. And um, Tristan, our accountant, was like, yeah, it always happens. Just whatever you think you're going to get, Harvard. Like, it's not going to, you're never going to get it all. Just don't worry about it. I'm like, oh, but I needed that money. <laughs> um, but now, um, we've, yeah, like I said, willed it into existence. It's something that, you know, that exists out there and people talk about it, write about it. Um, and it all came from just giving it a go, asking friends to try it. There were little test groups um, and being persistent at it. If we weren't persistent at it, it would have been sunk in some of the meetings we had with event, um, security professionals or emergency services professionals. You probably put up a big fight. <laughs> a yeah. Oh, yeah. The amount yeah. of meetings, and then after we did it successfully, the next meeting, the meeting next year with Parks Victoria was, hey, we'll just go to coffee. Should we? Oh, yeah. Then I got married recently. He's like, oh, how was that? That was good. So, are we good for inflatable regatta 2017? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you guys are fine now. Okay. <laughs> Take him out for coffee. That's your solution. That was well. No, no he, he didn't want anything else because we'd put all of our, you know, um, work in and effort in to build it up, to gain the trust, to get the relationships and. Whatever you've got behind, like in front, like a product or whatever, the relationships behind the scene is something that I've learned um, just being, being in business myself, but also doing the side hustle, that really open doors that smooth over sort of like little problems that are inevitably going to come up because nothing is, nothing is just, you know, here's this, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll go our separate ways. It's much more complicated. Thanks. Yeah. Laura, how about you? So I was sailing down the river, drinking a gin, no, <laughs> but we um, kind of, so I live in Brunswick, which if you know is um, very hipster and there's uh, lots of old Italians and it's kind of like a commune, so we all know our neighbours. So we were having a dinner party one night with our neighbours, drinking gin, and uh, it turns out that everyone has kind of some of the requisite skills, so one of our neighbours is a welder, and he's like, yeah, I can make a still, we can make gin, great. Uh, so the next day he actually came back with a still, and we're like, this is cool, but uh, I'm not sure about all of the licenses to do with making gin. So it turns out we're really bad at making actual gin, <laughs> but we're really good at making non-alcoholic gin. So part of it sort of came around. What goes in gin, out of curiosity? So regular yeah. gin has sort of, um, has an alcohol base that you then uh, steam distill through botanical, well, you distill them through botanicals. Um, and we start with a water base, so there's never any alcohol in it. Um, steam distillation to crack the botanicals, and then you get the essences out in very, like, very strong flavors. Um, so it turns out that the, between our neighbours we all have sort of some very useful skills. So one neighbour's an engineer, great. Uh, one neighbour is a neuroscientist, so anything scientific and measurements, perfect, he's got that. Uh, one's a copywriter, so marketing and comms. One's an accountant. Uh, one's a food technologist. So putting all those skills together we ended up making, making the product and um, working on it. And uh, basically I had this sort of idea like, oh yeah, let's give it a go made some non-alcoholic gin, thought, oh, no one will ever buy this because it hasn't got alcohol in it, um, and we were totally wrong. Um, sold out over Christmas, and uh, then realised a bit Where like, did you sell them? So we were just selling online. Okay. Um, As in, like, Instagram? Yeah, or Instagram. We put it out to our friends on Facebook, and then we said, we don't deliver anywhere other than Greater Melbourne. Uh, so immediately, people from Queensland wanted it. I <laughs> <laughs> don't even know how to do shipping. Um, <laughs> So we, it's basically us delivering on our bicycles or in a car at the beginning, just going around, like finding the place that's going to drop it off and actually hand delivering the product, which is like a new version of shopping perhaps. <laughs> um, and yeah, just kind of decided we had to take it a bit more seriously. Um, and now kind of putting in some of the, the processes to sell a bit more. When did you decide to take it seriously? Uh, basically when we sold out in 24 hours. And we were like, oh, so you had the validation, oh, yeah. first you just tested it, everything wasn't quite right, and then you had the validation and then you decided to... Yeah, okay. so invest a little bit more time in yeah. what we're doing and professionalise a little bit more. And where, where did it touch on Ida? Ida Sports or Ida? Ida. Ida. Ida Sports. All the Spanish people are going to call it Ida. Yeah. <laughs> they call Wi-Fi Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. Um, yeah. Call it what you want. Yeah. yeah, so when you go global, you're going to have that issue with the Spanish yeah. market. Perfect. So where did that start? 
So um, that, I was at the top of Kilimanjaro with all these women who are professional soccer players and um, I've always been annoyed because I could never buy uh, women's football boots. I have to buy kids' boots and I hate walking onto the pitch in like 12-year-old boy shoes because I'm not a 12-year-old boy. Um, and apart from grumbling about it myself, I was chatting to all these other women and they were like, yeah, I have sort of bad boot buying experience. I can't do this, can't do that. So I decided to research it and take it a little bit more seriously. Um, and I have not been a shoemaker. So um, first step was like, can I make a shoe? Um, which we now know we can, which is great. But it's, it was very much started from this like, I have a problem, do other people have a problem? Can we do something about this problem? Okay, so, okay. so um, I guess my next thing is I want to know, obviously you guys have certain skills that enable you to do these things to, with some degree of success. I want to touch on what do you think are your superpowers? You might be really good at something, other things, again, I'm guessing you rely on your team members, your co-founders, but what are those things that you think are your superpowers, and how have you used them in your, your side hustle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I'm really good at persuading people to do impossible things, and this sometimes gets me into trouble because I ask too many favours of people, but it also, it, it means everyone's involved. So. Um, like Courtney was saying, it's all about relationships. But just build really, really strong relationships with people, and then they kind of open their doors to you. And these experts who really you should be paying don't don't you don't need to pay, and then you end up with amazing design work or website skills or things like that. So build building great relationships. Yeah, building great relationships. Also, audience, you can tune in as well and put your superpower on. It'll end up with on a word cloud up there. We have someone who doesn't know yet, but that's all right. Maybe you're going to work it out soon. <laughs> Courtney, your superpower. Um, I guess uh, I'm, I'm patient, really um, patient when I have to be, but I'm extremely impatient. And flicking oscillating between those two has been sort of something that's really been handy for us. Um, you know, I will sit and listen and wade through the documents and do all of that so that when the time comes, we can pull the trigger and just sort of jump on whatever we need to do. Um, the, other, the other thing um, which has helped us through a lot is just asking why, like people would say you can't do that and like just, they, it's not, it, it, it feels like a superpower because it's got us through so many hurdles, more so than, you know, me being able to, you know, call up a friend who's in, uh, like write a press release or somebody else being able to write a project management sort of, you know, document. Um, just asking why when somebody says, oh no, you can't do that or, you know, this isn't happening understanding the process so then you can be a part of it and change it has been something that has been extremely powerful um, to us in you know how we how we've gone about it and by us I mean like a loose collection of people that used to drink together that now just don't drink as much together <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I can hear like it's it's the art of the persuasion with you as well because you're digging to the why to then challenge it right yeah yeah because there's a People will tell you that you can't do it, but usually you can, unless there's some law against it. But it obviously, Even if there is, that doesn't it often, matter, take them out for coffee. I'm just for, sorry, for an example, I was at an event and the sen a senior manager of Parks Victoria was rung up by another Parks executive and said, asked her, can I take my canoe on the river? Like, they didn't even know, because they hadn't bothered to, like, you know, because people just assumed, and that's a Yarra-specific thing, but... The, the assumption that something can't be done is, is pretty universal and, and it is a little bit frustrating to see somebody go like, oh, you, you're not going to be able to do that, you won't be able to do that. But if, if, you, if they haven't tried it and know from first-hand experience, well then, I don't think they're worth listening to. Sorry, mm -hmm. frustrating. <laughs> I can relate, yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, mine's pretty much the same. Um, building relationships, especially um, with my nine to five, it is kind of like, um, dealing with a lot of other entrepreneurs um, and kind of what Courtney said before is you don't just say oh here's that and give it back it's not just give and take like you do um, build rapport with people and kind of when the time comes um, you know you can maybe ask a favour um, and then you know I can give one back things like that so um, I'd say that building relationships with people but also I just kind of just jump and just do stuff so I kind of don't do the patience thing and like look through um, like documents I probably should I just kind of go for it which is a good and a bad I guess um, but then also like I don't really take no for an answer either so um, I guess an example would be for our edible clay product um, 
I knew that it could happen, like we could actually make the product. I didn't really know how because I've not done anything with food before. Um, but it took me about eight months to um, actually get an answer from the health department, from um, Food Standards Australia New Zealand, from the TGA, exactly who I actually had to go through. And it turned out that I didn't have to go through um, Therapeutic Goods Association. I had to just go through... Um, FSANZ, which was so much easier and cheaper than going through the TGA. And like it was literally asking questions who can help me and asking and going through these people. And if this person said no, then I'm like, great, no worries, but do you know who can help me? Or would you suggest someone in your network? Do you know of this? this can this be done? Um, so I guess I'm just like always finding a way to do things, or I hope mm -hmm. I can. Okay. And has side hustling always been your thing, or was there like a turning point? Um, should I just come in? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess um, for me, I've always needed to be busy. So, um, you know, throughout like uni and stuff, I always had like two jobs or just kind of playing sports, things like that. And when I guess I went to uni, I was kind of like, well, how else can I make money? Or, you know, how else can I kind of um, learn things? And I guess I always was creative in a way, like I always used to make like jewellery and like sell it to friends and like I don't know, make some random knickknacks for my parents and like, they just accepted it and they probably wasn't that good. Um, Did you sell it to them? Yeah, <laughs> give it to them. <laughs> so don't have to do chores. But yeah, um, so I guess it kind of, I guess just being busy and learning has always been ingrained in me but then um, when I went to uni and kind of saw and like kind of these um, speeches and things like that that we used to go to at uni um, and meeting people and seeing kind of how other people can not just do nine to fives can actually just do whatever they want you know just be flexible in the way that they wanted to live their life and I just thought well I want to make that life for me too. So. Um, yeah I, I sort of can't sit still so I'd have projects where whatever they were sort of on the go or you know trying to get on the river you know without knowing that it was going to turn into something that um, with occupies. Um, and I, like, I think I own a lot of domain names. Um, How many? Because I own a few, and I, I was wondering if it's a weird hobby people have. No, I think I'm, I'm whittling them down, so I reckon I'm down to about 25 or 30. <laughs> so, um, but I can explain every single one of them. Really? I just haven't put the time into them. Do you want to explain like, one for us today? Um, <laughs> oh, there's one that we're actually trying, but it's going to be called something else, which is... Oh, no, I don't want you to steal that. Yeah. What's, You're bought, right? You have ownership oh, no, rights. No, there's, there's one. Um, it's called Niche with three eyes because you can get a .com for that. And it's just um, very highly specific products or services in Melbourne. So if you want, like, non-alcoholic gin, like, there's there's a special page just for that. Dot .niche? No, 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 no. Like, it's like... It's sort of like, you know, rough sort of like yellow pages sort of yeah. listing, but you can browse through and find, like, I had, um, I had some shoes that needed to be repaired, but they're cross-stitched um, or um, woven leather, and they, people kept saying, you can't do that. I'm like, oh, there's got to be a shoe repair person that does that. But there's so many, like, the market and the services are getting so specific and fragmented um, that you, they, I thought there must be a market for people who want to market their marketplace stuff. But, oh. Yeah, I... I spent about three hours on Saturday and then my wife asked me to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you've got so many things on the go. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. they're not on the go. That's, that's just, <laughs> just a one-off. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Uh, like, I've had online stores before um, to see what it was like to have an online store and then I've used those skills and built them into inflatable regatta. Um, and it sort of, yeah, it just comes out of, um, you know, just... How so, did you learn to have online stores? Like, how did you build them? You just taught yourself? Oh, Shopify. You just spend 29 bucks American. Um, yeah, and yeah. just test and sell things you think people like. Well, if I'm going to spend 30 bucks, you know, doing something else, and I'd rather do this, then I don't think it's $30, well, you know, poorly spent as an entertainment source. That's brilliant. Because it's yeah. just something that you can try and look at and then either keep going or just put it aside and you've only spent 30 bucks, yeah. depending on the exchange rate. And you've learned so much and you're using the skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, it does look a lot like me with my head in the computer. So if you walked away and came back four hours later, it wouldn't make me look like I've done anything. <laughs> um, yeah, always kind of similar things. Always had side projects and um, lots of, uh, I don't want to call them failures, I want to call them learnings, um, of little tiny micro businesses that perhaps haven't worked or haven't done as well. But each of them kind of, <laughs> storing up the ideas to then like put it in and get some focus and similar to um, 
Caitlin last year I studied a Masters of Entrepreneurship at uh, the Wade Institute in, in town and so that really helped me to focus and get some frameworks to be able to interrogate the ideas and go in a much more uh, focused fashion to, to achieve what I want to achieve. So always kind of doing them but being able to really streamline what we're doing and get rid of the, the rubbish ideas a lot faster because they can hold you back sometimes. And what's um, like one of your top business tools? What's your go-to business tool? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I guess like a range of tools, being able to do stuff really... I love it, the answer is multiple. Yes, <laughs> Not one, I multiple. Sorry. But like being able to do stuff really fast to test it, to get to the answer of yes or no, is probably the best thing. So whether that is using Shopify to put your thing on the market and see whether someone buys it, whether it's uh, building a website or whether it's kind of throwing up an Instagram or doing any of those things. Like There are so many tools now that make it really easy if you're non-techie to be able to just do that. So using Canva to make a beautiful advert that you can then put on Facebook to test. So the, the kind of the range of digital tools that are available to you are so great to be able to put in very, very small amounts of money to be able to get a massive like yes or no, which is what you want. Yeah. Canva's phenomenal. For those of you that don't know in the room, it's a completely free <coughs> online design tool that makes you um, be pretty much like a designer. And it's a free design school. And it's founded by an Australian female, Melanie Perkins, who now lives in the States. <laughs> she can out effort anyone, she says. She's phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Um, Google Drive, hands down. Google Sheets, Docs, everything else that comes with it. We use Google Forms to survey people. Um, drive to write it. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, what's it called? Um, sheets for contact lists and database, like really rudimentary databases, um, and Docs for ideas and you know, rough collaboration. So yeah, by far that's been the most useful for us. It's a good classic. Yeah, um, yeah I was gonna say Canva for sure, because um, I am not a designer at all. I'm pretty bad, but I can rock up a good Instagram tile or, um, I don't know, advert as well. Um, but yeah, um, or Slack for communication, because um, I have a business partner and we both work full time still, so it's really good to kind of have different feeds. Um, have like for website or finances or um, social media things like that and it was kind of pop up there. Put so your hand up here if you have heard of Slack. Okay, most people. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's pretty much it. It's like it's like Facebook Messenger for yeah. work, but with channels. So hashtag website, hashtag marketing, things like that. Yeah, yeah fantastic. We might do some audience questions. What's I think? Hi, I'm Emily. Um, just a question that came up with the phone. If you find it so important to speak to your clients and you're working your day job nine to five, how do you best manage that? I'll give it to someone on the panel. <laughs> I made that claim. <laughs> Well, I'm probably the worst person to answer this because I hate being on the phone um, and I'm such an email person, um, especially with kind of um, organising stockists and things like that. Um, and I pretty much, I can send like 150 emails a night, which is really good for me and use some boomerang as well, which you can schedule the next day. Um, and legit, it's just like um, during work hours, like my lunch breaks and things like that. Luckily with my job, um, it's quite flexible, so um, I can work from home some days and um, you know I'll just take half an hour and do my um, client calls then, but I am so the opposite of Jason and I just email the heck out of things. So. Um, I, I really like the phone. Um, you can set up these, um, uh, like, um, uh, oh, my wife, good luck at Deacon. Thanks, thanks, Ron. <laughs> um, um, yeah, you can set up these automatic reply messages on, I know you can do it on iPhone, you can probably do it on Android, where um, you cancel the call and then it can send, you can choose which text message you send next. So, call you back in a minute. Mine says something like, I'm in a meeting, but I'll call you back as soon as possible. Because for my day job now, I'm often in a um, studio recording something. And that has been great because people understand like everyone's busy is such a mantra that you know if you say you're busy people believe it it's um it's just you know and it's accepted which is the great thing about it so i yeah i reckon do that and then just call people back when whenever you can and like the acceptable time periods for calling people is like stretching out so <laughs> like 8 a.m to maybe 7 p.m is just sort of yeah. fine now but maybe that's me getting a bit pushy um <laughs> But you can always, I don't know, schedule. It, you really, you can take care of so much more stuff, I find, and things can happen quicker. 
Um, particularly, one thing I usually try and do is get the person to send me an email after the phone call, and I don't have to remember everything the phone call was about, and they get my email address and they've got a task to do that reminds me to do something for them. Um, same with me putting a question mark in emails to people that I want to get back to me. I just sort of try and routinely get a question mark in there and then that way they yeah, come back. If you don't know how to make edible mud or shoes, for example, um, how do you go about sourcing designers, experts in this area or do you learn? I love that question because it comes up often. Do you need to learn the thing you don't know or do you need to find a team member that knows it or do you need to hire someone? How have you guys approached this, Laura? So I, I just get really curious, so I took a hacksaw to a football boot um, and basically wanted to find out what it was made of. Uh, so that was essentially, I went right back to basics, um, ripped it apart, worked out what all the materials were, I actually cooked, I was just telling these guys, I cooked up the sole in my kitchen for our first prototype, um, but we did go and find a good shoemaker to make the upper. So kind of a mixture of you really need to know enough about it to be able to ask the right questions of the expert because otherwise they'll just look at you like you're really stupid so that involves um kind of understanding what a last is which is all about the model for your for your shoe and so we went to our sort of first meetings and we're like i don't know what this is okay make notes like google later so knowing enough to get you to be able to ask, ask the right questions the expert is probably the... And how did you learn all that in a short period of time? What did you do? Ah, oh, just Google. Just Google? Just Google. Did you talk to like a professional shoemaker or you just Google? Oh yeah, like talk to as many people as possible as well. Yeah. Uh, a lot of YouTube videos, so I've watched a lot of factory um, how to make shoes in a factory videos, which uh, fun Friday nights. <laughs> um, thoroughly recommend it if you're going into the shoe industry. But um, okay. yeah, basically putting in the time to really get your head around it. Okay. I'm going to jump to the second question. Once you have a niche, how do you approach someone whilst protecting your idea? Um, I, I, this used to keep me awake. I was like, of course, someone's going to take it. We can't trademark inflatable regatta because it's too obvious. Like, it's <laughs> too blatant. Like, it's a, you know, you can't trademark. How does Apple get away with this? Lawyers. One thing that I've realised um, that probably doesn't apply to people in this room is people that hear about your idea probably won't bother doing it because they'll make excuses why it can't be done um, and that's something I found like I thought someone's going to take it an event company is going to like you know do this and of course it looks great and everything I don't know how good it's going to be but, but no one will take it because they don't they can't be bothered putting in the work that you know that you can and Often um, people might think it's a great idea, but acting on that, I, I, I don't think it's something that I've really ever heard about in Australia. Um, and I've spoken to a, a handful of like um, founders from America or people that have gone over to America. They're even sort of more free in um, California with the ideas. Like they'll just tell their idea to anybody just to get it out. Um, I wouldn't be too, like you can look at trademarks um, and patents depending on what, um, what you've got. but. Really, you know, you can be doing it, and the fact that you're doing it might scare somebody else off doing it, or have them come to you and say, you know, can I learn a bit more about this? I love that. Um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about it too much at this stage. Yeah, I remember hearing Dan Flynn from Thank You Water in a talk, and he said, you know, the value of an idea lies in execution. Yeah, the and I think that rings so true because if you're sitting on an idea and you're like, oh, I haven't executed, it. I've had this idea for two years. In that time, you could have executed it. Someone could have tried to steal it and not been so successful because you're so passionate about it. You should only be acting on the ideas that you know have mm. that you think have merit, and you have the skills to execute or are willing to learn them. And like that's not easy. Yeah, the yeah. way we protect ours is by putting investing a lot in branding. That's yeah. the only way we can differentiate. That's ourselves what people can't take off you. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Um, another question. Let's see, okay. For a student who has an idea for a side hustle but perhaps is struggling to start it and save up money for it, what advice can you provide to tackle this? Oh, um, I needed a few thousand dollars, but we got with for um, some branding and um, uh, what else? To order some boats. But um, other than that, we started getting money in, um, uh, through um, sponsorship. So maybe four thousand dollars, five thousand okay. dollars. Cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But this was a re relatively expensive side hustle, I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, under a thousand bucks is probably manageable. Okay. Depending on what you're doing. Caitlin, what about you? 
Um, so yeah, Rosie and I put in I think fifteen hundred dollars each at the very beginning, um, so three grand all up, and a lot of that went to um, like our friend who was doing the graphic design because we couldn't um, figure out what we wanted the um, product to look like. Um, but I guess um, probably if you're struggling, you have to kind of like to kind of come up with the money or whatever like that. You just have to be really creative. So. I guess um, with our product at the very beginning, like we, like even up until like last year, I was hand mixing it. Like, look, literally, like there's tubs of clay and mud and things like that. Like we couldn't afford a manufacturer, um, and the minimums were too high. So I was like getting there, looking like Breaking Bad, clay everywhere. Um, just like my parents were like, can you get out of our dining room? Um, so you know, save cost that way. But also like with the packaging, um, no one really noticed. But there's like. Well, probably a lot of people know this, but on the very beginning, like on the top of our thing, it's like got this black tape, um, and we sealed it with black electrical tape from Bunnings because we couldn't <laughs> afford a heat sealer. So we're like, yeah, that's totally just part of our brand vibe, and we always have black on the top. And like, on when this literally was like, took a year and a half or something. We're like, okay, maybe we should just get a heat sealer and then actually seal the products properly. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So you just got to kind of get creative and kind of just make it happen. Like, what are the things you really need um, to make it work? So maybe a website, like a template, like 30 bucks a month, or, you, you know, they give you the um, that first month for free. Maybe test that. Um, and then kind of just try and do some stuff yourself and see that it has legs. And, yeah. buy it, so. and, you know, often, like, like you can see, it doesn't cost as much as you think. Yeah. There's this common, mis I think there's this is a misconception that it's going to take a lot of money to start something. I think time's a different thing that we might touch on as well, which is... One of the next questions which disappeared. Um, oh, that's okay, I remember that one because uh, I had it on my list too. But yeah, often it sounds like it's going to cost a lot of money to start something, and like you can see, it's it's not that high. The other thing I want to recommend is in the current climate, there's so many startup pitch competitions, mm -hmm. and some of them are very early stage, and you win prizes by going there. And some of them are you know in kind advice, you know you get a zero account for a year. All the things that are going to cost you money are usually chucked in for free for like second, third runners up prizes. So. Google startup pitches, it, might, it, it does two things. I think it gives you a little bit of cash, it might just be a grand or less, um, and it also gives you PR and exposure. You get to pitch full, or to a room full of people and you started marketing before you even have a product. Just whip up a domain name up there and just say, you know, we're, we're about to launch soon, just enter your email. So you're doing that sort of data-driven marketing from the start. Um, I think one of the questions was, and, and that I had is, how, do you, how much time does your side hustle take, if it's still a side hustle? Um, and how do you manage your time? Oh, <laughs> I mean, you said you used to go out drinking. You don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, that's, that's the main thing, like changing your priorities. So I hear, I speak to a lot of people that are like, oh, how do you fit it all in? Or like, oh, I can't do this. I, like, I'm really busy. And, you know, and I'm like, well, actually, it's just you choose, how you choose to spend your time. Obviously, you need to earn money. So that's like priority, pay rent, make sure you've got stuff to eat. But then other than that, how you choose your to spend your time is really up to you. So if you want to go out drinking, like maybe cut back on that and you can use the money that you would have spent on drinking to go and invest that into your $30 a month Shopify account to go and sell something. So um, I just reprioritized what I, how I wanted to spend my life. So I do a lot less drinking on a Friday evening, but I do a lot more Skype calls and selling of different things um, and enjoy it quite a lot more. So. Yeah. Is it a trade-off, right? It's always a trade-off. But if you're willing to spend a bit of time to invest in your product, like your idea, and really bring it to life, and you're really passionate about it, then spend that time. Um, Reprioritise, cull a few things, stop watching Netflix. Like, <laughs> spend it on Googling shoe manufacturing videos in China uh, instead. <laughs> Do you still chill out and watch Netflix? I love this cloud behind us as well, of like time, money, fear, failure, idea, direction. Some interesting ones there. <laughs> That's fantastic. What about you, Courtney, around time management? Oh, I, I constantly answer emails and write emails on my phone um, or write tasks for myself. So um, you can get, you know, you can get two or three minutes anywhere to like write an email and then when you get somewhere you don't have like 15 emails that you've got to do or like 15 people that you want to try and reach out to. Um, and um, oh, in the morning I try and get something done before I go to work just to kick it off and for the day and space it out just sort of relentlessly sort of getting in contact or you know just knocking off little tasks here and there. Um, there's really a lot of, I, 
you realize you can get a good two hour chunk in the evenings, you know, if you break it down, um, you know, and you're working nine to five. But studying is a bit of a different thing. Like, I remember feeling like I had no time when I was studying, but, you know, I was drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so you had time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just doing other Pretty things, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess same with Courtney. So I usually do like an hour in the morning and clear out my try to my inbox, um, and then kind of do nine to six at the league, and then log off, have some dinner, whatever I want, and then do like there is a good chunk in the evening. So um, usually from like eight till ten thirty, I'll do mud stuff or whatever like life admin things. So um, and I'm very much a list person, so I need to have like a task list, and I usually make sure that. I've got a list for the next day, so when I wake up, I know exactly what my day is going to be like. That there's not going to be any surprises, um, and then I time block my day as well. Yeah. So, okay. Fear. Has any of you received some really good advice on fear or self doubt? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I, like, I would just say, you know, hold your nose, close your eyes, and jump. Um, give it a go because once. That also helps with the momentum when you when you're put in that situation you've just sort of got to keep going and that's um, you know terrifying but it's not that terrifying because if you fail nothing particularly bad has happened um, you know you don't even have to tell too many people that you're doing it so it's not like hey I'm launching this business isn't it great now I'm going to start doing the work for the business you can be doing it leading up you can even be if it's an online business you can be selling and nobody would know like none of your friends so you don't have that sort of fear of um, you know, maybe it's just, I'm just assuming it's a sort of social fear of failure, but um, uh, I don't know, you Google quotes about it because there are so many, I, I, they all sort of like mix into one and after you've had a go and had a crack and you'll see that it's not that bad, the fear is something that's, um, you know, that lo looms large but it's really just a shadow, there's, yeah. there's not a lot of substance to it unless you, you know, pharmaceutical drug. If I was making a pharmaceutical drug, I'd be genuinely scared. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, do you want to add to that, Laura, around your best advice around failure yeah, or Yeah, I guess I'm just relentlessly optimistic that everything will work out, um, mm. and I proceed on that basis. Um, mostly, will it make a great story at a dinner party, even if it goes horribly wrong? But I'm also quite very practical in terms of mitigating risks, so I always put a time limit on things, um, a financial limit on things, um, and kind of validation questions. So if at this point we've not reached this, then as much as I love it, we stop doing it. And What's your general time limit for each of the side hustles you have? Um, so it depends how much time versus investment. So for example, for the shoes, our um, limit is we're taking it to a crowdfunder at the end of May. After that month, if we've raised the financing through the crowdfunder, we'll go ahead with it. If we haven't, then we'll have to dial it back and go and work a bit more. Um, perhaps still keep it on on the side, put it more to the side. But really having this kind of giving yourself a, a period of time that's like, okay, these are all the things I can do. I know at the end of that time I've done my best and maybe it's not right for the market at this time. So, um, yeah, don't kid yourself. So be relentlessly optimistic, but also be practical about it and set in place these and write them down because otherwise you can kid yourself and be like, yeah, it's fine. I haven't spent this much money. You're like, yes, you have. Stop now. <laughs> I think we touched on initial suppliers with how you went to go find people like shoemakers and things like that, and you went to Kmart for your main um, inflatable regatta. Um, how about how, once you have, I know we've done that one, best way to keep momentum going? Uh, I'd say you, you can just kid yourself that it's like progressing and that way you can just like keep we sort of every year when we do it because it takes us three months of the year full time me and another guy to do it while we sort of tick away at it across the year the event um, it's just crashing through walls like by the end of it I was a robot um, and I'd smashed a car in Seymour um, so it's just believing that it's just that it's that it's going to keep going um, and it's like that, the, I come back to the patient impatience thing, like I'm impatient about what I'm doing, um, you know, what's ahead of me, but like I'm very patient about like, you know, the, the sort of the road ahead and what, what it can be. So knowing that um, when we did it once, it was like, oh great, well then let's just do it again. Um, I would, um, it, like having a limited group of friends that are quite supportive as well, or a partner, is another great way because being able to bounce that off them um, and just somebody to like tell like you know how you're feeling because if you 
if you like have a high emotional investment in it, it's not just something sort of reasonably transactional that you're doing for money. Um, like you, you, inevitably, you'll crash. It's just it's just horrible. But um, you know, it sort of makes you a bit stronger. And when it happens, you know how to pick yourself up psychologically and just sort of get back on it. But you can, and like I said at the start, you can will things into existence, and other people will believe you as much as you believe that it exists. Um, also, not to kid yourself, there will be some lows, so it's not always amazing times. So, um, you know, pick yourself up. Um, you know that there will be a better time to do it. Um, and for, you know, just to have those goals and make sure you're kind of working to the goals that you've set at the beginning. So I have kind of like a checklist of, you know, in, like this time next week I want you know, this many stockers or um, kind of just setting future goals. And, you know, it can be five years, can be, you know, two years, but I literally just do month by month sometimes, just if I am kind of feeling a bit deflated, um, I haven't really put that much time into, you know, mud as what I probably wanted to at the time. Um, so I just had a massive conference last week for work, so I did like no work on mud, um, but this week kind of picking myself back up. Um, and I think it's just because I have a business partner as well, just bouncing off, um, her and like kind of pick up where I've left off and things like that so if I'm like I'm out I uh, can't really do much for the next three days Rose will be like no worries I've got that um, and I think you just kind of have to believe that it will work as well so that's half the battle like if you think it'll work then it'll work like you put it out to the universe something will happen so it will. Oh one other thing that somebody else told me when um, they were saying um, they have a, had a startup that's now in Dallas. Um, that celebrate your wins. You know, when we have a little win, no matter how small it is, like we try and either sort of just psychologically pat ourselves on the back <laughs> or that's turn to week. each other, yeah, and be like, this happened. You know, isn't that yeah. great? And that keeps the momentum going a lot for us as well. We do high fives. <laughs> um, and we're, we're branded merchandise. So, um, and get your friends to wear it as well, because then you feel guilty every time you're not working on it and you see them posting, <laughs> wearing your stuff, and you're like, oh yeah, that business. Um, but also like wear your own stuff, because if you don't believe it, no one else is gonna believe in it. And I actually should have probably been wearing oh. more today. Oh, you've done it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I usually wear it on the weekends only, but. Yeah. Exactly. So you've actually made it stylish. You can barely tell yeah. the brand. <laughs> We've got minimal. Oh, there's tote bags, limited amount, and some of the bags Badges that look like this over there. I think we have enough for the whole audience. But oh, wow. if we so run you out, can please wear start. them and make uh, Courtney feel bad when he's not working on the project. So Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks. How did you guys find your co-founder? If you have well, one, let's start with you all have a co-founder, and two, how'd you find them? So for Aces, we neighbours, so literally walked next door and knocked on the door. Um, <laughs> and that was really useful, uh, made it easy. And for uh, the shoes, I was actually playing futsal with my friend Ben for about six months and talking about this project about shoes and he was looking to quit his job um, and really sort of delve into the startup world and so I, I have a theory of uh, sports where you can tell a lot about a person by how they play on the pitch so uh, Ben takes his turn in goal, he's a really good cheerleader for everyone, has a bit of razzle dazzle occasionally, scores a goal so I was like oh maybe he'd be a great co-founder so um, <laughs> basically he jumped ship uh, from his job and we started working on the project together and it was one of those things where you like you really kind of get to know someone, get to know their values about what they're trying to create um, and then go forward. Um, I had a friend for years, I oh, was still a friend obviously, um, and um, <laughs> I would, He's not my friend <laughs> <now>. <laughs> um, We'd known each other for years and a lot of other people had sort of in, knew what inflatable regatta was but he was the only one that said oh do you want me to give you a hand with this and then I just kept parceling more and more stuff over to him and then it became, you know, to the point where we we're sort of sharing the load equally. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly with, well, with us, uh, you know, being a sort of, you know, it might rain on the day and the whole event gets called off and we lose $150,000, like, I mean, we've got insurance, but it still doesn't feel good. Um, hasn't happened. Um, <laughs> uh, they had just approached me and said, hey, can I do something? Do you want me to do something with this? Um, our volunteer manager has a PhD in Jewish history. Um, our strategic guy um, does consulting for comms, and you know, yeah, I sort of run everything else with, with a pretty um, average degree uh, or average scores in a degree. Anyway, um, just seeing seeing who's enthusiastic because that person has to be just as dedicated as you. I've been through one co-founder already with my current business that I work nine to five at, 
And it's because the thing that clued me on was they would ask me what to do rather than know what the business was and what areas needed to be filled and take the initiative. If you're leading them, it's not a co-founding partnership. Yeah. It's more like an employee relationship in that case. Yeah, yeah, and they own 50%. You're like, oh, come on. Just train you and you own 50%. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I met Rosie at uni, but through first year uni, so I kind of took a bit of a detour through university, did one year, kind of deferred, and then cancelled my enrolment, and then went back, had to reapply for my role, but I actually met Rosie in the first year of uni, and she'd gone through, met all these other people as well. Um, so it was kind of like, I'd met Rosie, um, we were friends, and then we... Was she in your class, or you met her at an event? Or? Oh no, so we, yeah, um, at, in our, the same class. Okay. Um, it was quite a small kind of crew at the beginning, it was probably, I think, under 100 people. Um, and then, yeah, and then we kind of kept that friendship going. And then um, when I eventually finished the degree, she was already finished like three years later um, before me. Um, then we kind of said, oh, like we both clearly like each other and we're friends. Um, and we both have the same passion and um, these ideas. So, yeah, that's fantastic. That's about all from me. If we can give um, a round of applause to our panel. <laughs>